welcome to Prep Station. I'll be taking you on physics and then we'll be looking at various angles to what you are going to meet in the class. So if you follow me with what I have here, we have some strategies that you need in order to attain success in physics as concerns UTME. As highlighted here, we just have three of those key uh, rules. Number one, in-depth understanding of each concept. You must understand the concept if you are talking about the concept of heat, you must have a good understanding of it. You are talking about wave, you are talking about magnets, as the case may be. The second one is identifying the facts in every concept. Why? Because if you look at your questions, you will have less of calculation and more of the facts. So you must have a grip of all the facts contained in all the concepts. And the third one is to have excellent grip at the mathematical relationship and then having the ability to apply it. So, if you have your formulas with you and you can't make use of it, definitely it's not it for you. So you must have a good grip at it and then have that ability to apply that. So, the components of physics that you are going to meet, we have them right here. There are four of them. You have your optics, which deals with light. We have your magnets, it's just a study of motion. It's divided into two parts. You have your kinematics, it talks just about the motion, and the dynamic part talks about the cause of that motion. So the third part of the component is electricity. And then the fourth one is heat. So we're going to be looking at them one after the other. The concept of optics, magnets, electricity, and that of heat. But for this class, we're going to start with optics. Just like I said before, optics involves light. So what is optics? Looking at what we have here. It is the branch of physics which is concerned with light and its behavioral pattern. That is how it behaves. Okay, and then looking at the properties of any form of light that we'll be discussing here. So there's what we call the spectrum, that is the patch of that light. Taken together is known by the time it's absorbed and emits, we refer to that emission as photons. So it is generally known as wave particle duality. Why do we say that? Because photons have two behavior. It behaves as wave and at the same time it behaves as what? As particle. All these things we are saying you can still see them as part of your question. So photons is said to be what? Wave particle duality. Okay, now let's look at the properties of light. How light behaves. One of the properties is that light can be reflected. That is, it can bounce off surface. That's what we call reflection. And it is applied to mirror, for example. And we have the second one of uh, the property as uh, refraction. Refraction simply means, you know, bending of light ray. So and it's applied to lens and microscope. We can also have what to call dispersion. What is dispersion? This one can be applied to prism. What does it do? Just to split light into its constituent color. Just for example, we take uh, rainbow as an example. We have how many colors of rainbow? That's about seven. So, and what causes it is white light. So, white light separating into its constituent color, that concept is known as dispersion. Another property of light is interference and the next one is called polarization and then the last one we have on the board is what we call diffraction i'm sure you have done this under the concept of wave interference is superimposition of two waves that is having the same amplitude and frequency moving together that is interference and then polarization is what uh polarization okay the concept is what when you focus a ray even to a plane surface, then we said you have what? Plane polarize it. And the last one is diffraction, which involves the bending of wave, light wave, or rays around corners. So we move to the next one. When is total internal reflection said to occur? Number one, 
when light travels from an optically more dense to optically less dense medium. Let's take note of two key terms here, more dense and less dense. A good example is from class to air. We're going to encounter this problem as we move on. Number two is that the angle of incidence in the denser medium must be greater than the critical angle. Until you cut across the critical angle, definitely total internal reflection will not occur. So, where can we point out the point of application? When a beam of light, for example, strikes the water, what do you notice? Part of the light is reflected, and then some part of the light is what? Refracted. What do we mean? Part of the light will bounce off, and part of the light will definitely bend in. So that concept explains what we call total internal reflection. Like I told you while we were starting, I said we are going to be uh, having a good grip at our mathematical expression. We have some of them here. So we're going to take the first part, one to six, and then we also explain from A down to E. So take a look at number one. Don't forget, the concept of light is, can be seen under the concept of wave. So that means I'm going to take wave in general now. Number one, we have V equal to lambda F. That is wavelength multiplied by the frequency. That is one key formula that we can we should always lay our hand on. Don't forget that your frequency is the inverse of the period. F is the frequency, T is the period. Take note of that formula. And number two, we call this wave motion. You must have this with you because at every point in time, question will always flow from here, not less than one or two. So we have Y, which is the vertical vibration, equal to A sine, open bracket, 2 pi x over lambda, minus 2 pi ft. What is the A standing for? That is amplitude. Your A is your amplitude. You have 2 pi x all over lambda, that's your wavelength, then 2 pi ft. Take note that 2 pi f represents your angular velocity. For example, let's take a look at something on the board here to uh, talk, talk about that number two. Assuming I have y equal to five sine, from what we have here, let me just meet it like that directly here. Lambda minus two pi f t. I told you that this represents wavelength. So I can have it in this form. So what do we have here? Assuming the question is, to determine the amplitude in this given equation, you simply know that the answer is going to be 5. If the instruction is given to be in centimeter, that means your amplitude automatically becomes 5 cm. What have we just done? Just to compare the equation given to the standard equation, which we have on the board. Let me go to number 3. You have n equal to 360 all over theta minus 1. Where do we use that formula? 360 divided by the theta, which is the angle, minus 1. When you are giving mirror, two mirrors inclined at an angle, for example, we have this. This is mirror inclined, two mirrors. So let's assume the angle here is, let me reduce this, for example, to 30 degrees. If you have to determine the refractive the number of images, sorry, formed by the inclined mirror, all you do is to divide 360 by the 30, which is angle of inclination, and take it, take one out of it. If you do this, you've gotten the number of images formed by the inclined mirror. So let me take number four. Number four, as you can see, one over U plus one over B is equal to one over F. I repeat, 1 over u plus 1 over b equal to 1 over f. What does it send across to you? That is what? The mirror formula. What does u stand for? That is the object distance. The v stands for image distance. And your f stands for the what? For the focal length. Alright? But you are, we are taking jump, so we have to be as fast as possible in handling questions. As you mean, you have to determine the focal length 
and you are giving the object distance and the image distance. And we already know that the general formula is 1 over f equal to 1 over b plus 1 over u. In order to be on the faster, to be at the faster pace, what do you do? You have to what? Make f the subject of formula. And you don't have that luxury of time. All you do is to use the product of the object distance and the image distance all over the sum. Because if you treat this definitely, it will result to this. Let's try it here. Here we have 1 over f, then you have BU as the LCM, you have U plus V cross multiply, you have BU equal to F into U plus V. We are looking for the focal length, what do we do? We divide both sides by U plus V, U plus V, which is equivalent to this. So what am I trying to say? Your focal length is equal to the product of the object distance and the image distance, all over the sum of the object distance and the image distance. I mean, number five. Five says F equal to R over two. As usual, F stands for the focal length. R is your radius of curvature. There is separate possibility that you need to do some manipulation before making use of the mirror equation. So getting the focal length first, for example, maybe before getting the object distance, and you are giving the radius of curvature. So what do you do? Make use of F equal to R over two to get your focal length then substitute into this equation to get whatsoever, whether object distance or image distance. And number six says m equal to v over u. Your m is the magnification. A magnification is the ratio of the image distance all over the object distance. Please don't make mistake of turning that as object over image. No, it is image distance all over object distance. So, 4, 5, 6, you can manipulate around it to solve one question. You might be giving the magnification or the object distance, as the case may be, do the manipulation and then you arrive at your answer. We're going to see problems that might evolve around that data. So let's come to the other side here, the refractive index. These are possible formulas that you will encounter under the concept of refractive index. A. Refractive index n is equal to the ratio of sine of incidence to the sine of refraction. Does that send a message to you? That is the second law of refraction. Do you know that? We call it what? Snell's law. What does it say? It says the ratio of sine of incidence to the sine of refraction is constant for a given pair of medium. That's it. For YX student, I think that will help a lot. But for JAM student, you are just to know the constant so that you apply straight away. B part, let's go there. We have refractive index equal to real depth all over apparent depth. You know what happened? When someone looks at a swimming pool, pool it might be apparent like it is five meters, but this swimming pool might be about 10 meters. What is happening there? What you can view is said to be what? To be apparent, but the real is what? 10. If I to get the refractive index, all you do is to divide the, the real depth, which is 10, all over the what? The apparent depth. So if I have this now, 10 by 5, my answer is 2. Please, there's no unit to this. So let's go to C part. Refractive index is 1 all over sine C. The C there stands for what we call the critical angle. Straightforward question, for example, the critical angle is giving to be 30 degrees. What is the refractive index? What do you do at that point in time? Just the inverse of the sine of the critical angle. So I will just have 1 over sine C. All right. So let's move to the D part. We have N equal to sine half A plus D. I'll write that here. N equal to sine half a plus D all over sine half A. What does this send across to you? This is the refractive index of a triangular prism. If you are giving a question under this. So what does A stand for? A is the angle of the prism. Assuming you are dealing with a, a triangle, from what we have on the board, we have N equal to sine half a plus d 
all over sine half of A. I said A stands for what? A stands for the angle of the prism. And most of the time, we always deal with the collateral triangle. That is, the prism is uniform. At that point in time, you have here to do what? 60 degrees. That means you are giving that type of question. Do not wait to get the 60 from there. The instruction will be in the type of prism that you are using. For example, an equilateral prism or a uniform prism. So once you have that, you know that your angle A is 60. And D is said to be minimum deviation. That will always be supplied in the question. So the A here and the A here are the same. So if we have here at 60, so that means I'll be having sine half of 60 plus whatsoever is given as the what? Minimum deviation. Assuming A is 60, because we're dealing it with the collateral triangle, and D is given as what? 40. What do you do at that point in time? You substitute into this. That is 60 plus 40, and we have what? 100. And half of 100 is what? Is 50. You don't have luxury of time, so you move straight as having sine what? 50 all over sine half of A is still stand as 60. So 60 by 2, I have what? My what? My chest. In handling this, you must have gotten your refractive index. So we're going to have a question that will treat this later.